All right, folks, this time I want to talk about cuts versus thrusts. Which one is better? And I put the air quote there because it's not really the right question. Better for what? So we're going to look at some pros and cons. And none of what I'm going to say is original. This has been discussed a lot, you know, both back in history as well as nowadays. And I'm pretty sure everything I've said has been stated by somebody at some time. Uh, but it's one of those fundamental topics that are good to address. So first off, let's state the obvious here. Blade shape matters. You know, if you have something like this, a narrow blade that tapers to a pretty fine point, this is not going to cut very well. This is a thrusting blade primarily. This on the other hand, a pretty wide blade. This cuts very well. Well, thrusts decently, but not as well as this. So if you were to compare these two, obviously um, thrust bad, cut good, but it's not that simple. Throughout history, sometimes either the cut or the thrust was favored for a time in a given place. Now, there were different military philosophies. Uh, well, not just military, also for private duels. And over time, those changed sometimes. And sometimes cuts and thrusts were used equally. Uh, one of the obvious sources to look at is George Silver's Paradoxes of Defense, uh, published in 1599. Um, now, he's a bit biased against the Italian rape here, uh, to the point of what I would personally call borderline nerd rage against the rapier. He, he did not like Italian rapier fencing very much. I mean, he refers to it as that boyish Italian weak imperfect fight. <laughs> that tells you everything. There is uh, quite a bit of bias involved here. Anyway, so if we look at what he's writing, uh, so he's comparing the thrust with the Italian rapier to the cut with a broadsword or other kind of cut and thrust sword, shorter blade. And uh, so um, he says here, the Italians claim that the thrust, because it goes in a straight line, is faster. You know, the shortest distance between A and B is a straight line, of course, um, whereas the cut, you know, travels in an arc. Uh, to that, he says that the cut is at least as fast. Now, this part you can, you can debate, and, and I, I take some issue with some of what he's saying, but it makes sense if you think about it in terms of footwork, you know, foot and hand action. So if, you know, assuming that both combatants start at a distance where neither can hit each other without taking a step, which is, that's generally how it starts, of course. And uh, then, so let's say I've got a rape here. Now, straight thrust, this is more direct than coming around for a cut at the camera lens. Um, however, this, this applies if I move just the hand. Of course, just the hand action is going to be a lot faster in a thrust than the cut. But if you take into consideration that you have to take that step to get into measure first, so if I'm outside of measure, I take an an advancing step into the thrust. By the way, the camera is not as close as it looks, it's just the lens. And if I then take an advancing step to do a cut, it's not all that different. I still need to take that advancing step with the leg and the leg work is slower than the hand work in general. Now, of course, you have to compare apples to apples. If you compare an advancing step thrust to a passing step cut, yeah, of course the cut is going to be slower because the, the passing step is slower than the advancing step. If you don't know what that means, an advancing step is one where you push off with the rear leg and just take one step forward with the lead leg, whereas with a passing step, it's the rear leg that passes the front leg and moves forward. So obviously that takes longer. It also covers more distance. The fastest possible thrust I would say is faster than the fastest possible cut. But 
No, it's not necessarily that dramatic of a difference. It all depends. Of course, it also depends on the weight of the weapon and other situational factors. Anyway, moving on. So what they also say, the Italians that is, is that if a thrust does hit the face or body, it endangers life. But if the blow hits the body, it is not so dangerous. And uh, this is, again, Italians through the mouth of George Silver. And Silver answers to that, the force of the thrust passes straight. Therefore, any cross being indirectly made, the force of a child may put it by. But the force of the blow passes indirectly. Therefore, must be directly warded in the counter check of this force. What he's referring to is that it's much easier to set aside a thrust. Even if there's a heavier blade, it comes in with a thrust, all I need to know, do rather, is just push it aside. This is really easy. Even though I'm technically at a disadvantage with a lighter blade, thrust really doesn't take me much to redirect that. Whereas if I had to parry a cut with a heavier blade, now this would be a problem because now there's a lot more mass in the attacking blade than there is in the defense. And this would cause me quite a bit of trouble. It would take more strength and more mass in the blade to successfully defend against that, at least in case of a static block. What you can always do, of course, is deflectional parries. So just moving aside. So he's correct in that thrusts are easier to defend against in the sense of requiring less force. However, they are harder to defend in another way. Namely, it's harder to see a thrust. Now, in this case, because I've, I've got the rubber blunt on this one for practice, it is easier to see. But if this wasn't on there, let me use this one instead. You, know, you don't see as well exactly how it's positioned. You know, depth perception makes it a bit harder. And you know, if this comes in and you may not see as well exactly how far it is away and it can be deceptive can also be quite fast in that way. The cut can be somewhat easier to see. Either it starts in a certain guard that makes it fairly clear that a cut may come from this guard, or it rolls up first, and I have very limited space here, and then comes through. The next claim made by Silver's Italians is that if a thrust does hit the face or body, it endangers life. But if the blow hits the body, it is not so dangerous. To which he replies, a thrust being made through the hand, arm, or leg, or in many places of the body and face are not deadly. Neither are they maims or loss of limb or life. Neither is he much hindered for the time in this fight, as long as the blood is hot. For example, I have known a gentleman hurt in rapier fight in nine or ten places through the body, arms, and legs, and yet has continued in his fight and afterward has slain the other and come home and has been cured of all his wounds without maim and is yet living. But the blow being strongly made takes sometimes clean away the hand from the arm has many times been seen. Again, a full blow upon the head or face with a short sharp sword is most commonly death. A full blow upon the neck, shoulder, arm or leg endangers life, cuts off the veins, muscles and sinews, perishes the bones. So what is being talked about here is that rapier thrusts and thrusts in general are more lethal, especially at the time. It doesn't take a whole lot of blade to reach internal organs and cause you know, either fatal damage to the lungs or heart or cause internal bleeding. And uh, of course, it can also cause uh, infection, particularly at the time with the medicine available. However, there's lethality and there is what we would call nowadays stopping power. So just because something is lethal doesn't mean it incapacitates the opponent right away. And uh, this is what uh, Silver is talking about here, that in, in their multiple accounts of duels from that time where the duelists were run through several times in various parts of the body and were able to continue fighting. And sometimes they actually killed each other or mortally wounded each other at least. And they were still able to continue fighting despite receiving several thrusts uh, simply because it's it goes deep but it's not a very large wound. It's not going to cause enough structural damage to prevent the opponent from moving properly. If you get a rapier thrust through the leg, of course it's gonna suck. I mean, that's pretty obvious, but you can still move the leg fairly efficiently, especially when on adrenaline, chances are they might not even notice at the time. Whereas a cut, 
you know, a good cut with a dedicated cutting blade can take the leg clean off or at least cut, you know, halfway through it, do enough damage to the muscles and or bones that it's simply not possible to use the leg anymore. There are lots of accounts, both historical and modern, of people surviving crazy things at least long enough to resist or run away or something. It goes to show that, you know, in, in a fight, in order to have martially valid attacks, if you will, you need to do enough structurally in incapacitating damage. So anything that prevents the opponent from standing or fighting properly or that does enough damage to the central nervous system to shut them down, you know, any kind of strike to the spine or the head that goes deep enough, things like that. However, there's another good point in there, namely that cuts to the body may not be as effective. Now, this depends very much on the blade. You know, if you have a relatively light blade, say a side sword, Yes, it would have a hard time penetrating deep enough. If you have something like this, you know, either a, a messer or a long sword with a fairly broad blade, then yes, this can, if done well, penetrate deeply enough, cut into the rib cage, you know, sever the, the collarbone and, and do all kinds of horrendous damage that would definitely stop somebody and be lethal. So the thrust can win in terms of lethality, especially when you take into consideration how much easier it is to do lethal damage. A thrust really doesn't take a whole lot. You can basically just hold the blade in front of you and step into it, and this is going to enter the body. Whereas a cut requires more skill, more force, etc. It can be more devastating, of course. You know. If you know, that the head is severed, then of course that's going to be more lethal than any thrust. But as a general rule of thumb, thrust can be easier. The next thing to consider is accuracy. It is a lot harder to hit a target with a thrust because you, you just have a small point to work with and it is, well, pinpoint accuracy being required. You know, if, Sure, if you're aiming for the torso, it's a large target, not as big of a deal. But in case of moving opponent, it just makes it that much harder. For example, if someone thrusts at my face, this is all it takes. It's just a minor movement of the head and I'm safe. If they cut at my head, this is not going to work. This, the cut is still going to follow me as long as it's in measure. I can't get away as easily as against the thrust. Now, everyone who has played video games involving swords knows that it's easier to hit with a cut because with a thrust, you have one point at which you hit. With a cut, there's this entire arc of the swing and there is almost an infinite number of points along that arc where you can hit. Now, technically, not every point of the arc in real life makes for an effective cut. If I, if I try to cut and I hit, I connect here already, I haven't built up enough velocity yet to cut effectively. It's easier to hit, especially a moving target with a cut, which is one of the reasons why the Montante, which is a two-handed greatsword, was popular for bodyguards at the time. You know, against multiple attackers, if you keep swinging this in wide sweeping motions, then they will be afraid to move in and you can cover a lot of ground with a sweeping cut as opposed to a thrust. Now, the other thing is thrusts can get stuck in the body. You know, if the, if the angle changes in some way and the blade flexes, then you may have trouble getting it back out. If you have multiple attackers coming in and you're stuck in, in the body of one, then yeah, you have a problem. With a cut, of course, a, a less than ideal cut can also get stuck in the body, but you know, it's more likely with a thrust, I would say. Then there's the issue of armor. Even if you have fairly light armor, like a, a padded gambeson, this can be surprisingly resilient against the sword cut, whereas a thrust goes straight through. No, no questions asked, really. And if you have fairly heavy armor, like a, you know, a suit of plate armor, it's pretty much cut proof. There is no way to really do significant damage. Even something like mail is mostly cut proof. And in case of 
cuts against mail, what really does the damage is more the, the blunt impact rather than the cut. So it can still be effective, but it just won't penetrate. And uh, with a thrust on the other end, this is exactly what swords like this are for. Now the thrust would either go through the armor directly in case of lighter armor, or it could be used to thrust into the gaps because Every armor has gaps somewhere, usually the armpits, the groin, and various other parts that need to be flexible, and then you can thrust in there with a point. So cuts wouldn't do anything. Okay, I should probably just mention one more thing to not make the video absurdly long, and that is confined spaces. Uh, cuts are definitely harder to do in confined spaces than thrusts. Now, here, this is a confined space. This is not a large room and I've got stuff stored here, so I'm, I'm pretty limited. Like I've got the ceiling to contend with. There is stuff to the right side out of the frame and there is stuff to the left side of video lights and all kinds of things that I could bump against if I'm not careful. So that makes it pretty difficult to throw effective cuts. Now, there are certain cuts that are more retracted. It makes it easier, like the swording cut, for example or a squinting cut. And those can compensate for that to an extent, but a thrust is always going to be easier. For the thrust, basically, you just need space in front of you. That's all it is. I don't need, I could be in a phone booth, in an open phone booth, like if stuff was left and right of me, I could still do a thrust no problem. I just need space in front of me. And even if I don't have that much space in front of me, I could use half sorting and retract that blade pretty far and use it at in very confined spaces. You may have experienced that in Dark Souls, for example, where sometimes a wall gets in the way and cuts off your cut. So yeah, and if you're dealing with limited space, then definitely a thrust can be better. However, overall, in, in real historical combat, most of the time, both are needed and useful. Unless you have a blade that just prohibits one or the other, you're going to use both, most likely. And um, I'd like to close this with a quote from George Silver saying exactly that. He says, in a fight, there are many motions. The hand will sometimes be in place to strike, sometimes to thrust. Sometimes in a place where you may strike and cannot thrust without loss of time, and sometimes in a place where you may thrust and cannot strike. There is no perfection in the true fight without both blow and thrust. So there you have it. You need both. They just have their pros and cons in particular situations. And that's about it. So thanks for watching. Hope you liked it. Also check out the links in the video description down below if you're interested in buying functional swords from a reliable source or if you want books about martial arts and that sort of thing. So I'll leave a bunch of interesting stuff there and uh, have a good one.